On today's episode of Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, I'm going off on a moose safari with Northwoods Outfitters in Greenville. According to our guide, our chances are very good. This time of year, we have about a 95% success rate. Spoiler alert, I'll tell you right up front, we didn't see any. Then, later in the show, I'm going to teach you how to speak loon. You can skip the last 10 minutes of the show if you already know what this means. I'm Bob Duchesne, and this is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. I'm always up in the North Woods. I see a lot of moose. A lot of moose. I don't even think about it. They're just there. But what happens when you need to find one? In fact, you've got to find that moose in the next four hours. Well, now the pressure's on. You've got to think like a moose. You've got to know specific places they might be lurking. In fact, you know many places they might be lurking, but you've got to guess which one is best right now. You've got to know their habits, what they're eating this time of year, where they escape from bugs. I'll tell you, when you've got to produce a moose, it's a lot harder than it looks. I learned more from today's failure to find a moose than I ever would have if we had succeeded. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Supercuts in Bangor, Brewer, and Old Town. Here's the situation. I know a lot of guides and companies that do moose watching tours. Northwoods Outfitters in Greenville came to the top of my mind because they're really experts at outfitting you with everything, whether it's buying outdoor clothing or renting canoes and kayaks. They've been doing moose safaris for a long time, and they certainly know the Moosehead area, which is exactly where you would expect to find a moose. So a few days ago, I tagged along. There were six other moose watchers in the van, two from Virginia, three from Georgia, and one from the Carolinas. The guide is Ashley Patterson. Ashley lives with her husband, Mark, in Shirley. He's also a master main guide. If you recognize Ashley's name, it might be because she's well-known in the sled dog racing world, having competed six times in the Can-Am 250 up in Fort Kent. They raise racing dogs at their kennel in Shirley, and right now I think she said she's got 52 of them. We're heading north from Greenville to Cacajo. Certainly you can try your luck driving around the woods and hoping to stumble over a moose, but right now they're mostly feeding on aquatic vegetation and ponds, which also gives them some relief from biting insects. So our goal is to pick one of these ponds and paddle in, if necessary. Or we might just get a few moose standing around near the canoe launch. As we're driving, Ashley's talking, and I'm learning a lot. For instance, it never occurred to me that moose had to learn where to go. So each pond, bog, or marsh has been shown to them by their mother, in which they certainly have to feel safe in order to bring their young calf out there. And there is no such thing as guaranteeing it. You know, it's not a zoo. But I'm not going to lie, you know, this time of year we have about a 95% success rate. Why? It's because it is still considered bug season. And as I already mentioned, worse the bugs are the better our moose sightings are because it does drive them out of the thick of the woods where they want to stand in the openings for wind flow okay first problem there are no bugs the previous day was rainy the night was a little wild but this morning has dawned clearer and a little cooler and there is no wind yet and i haven't swatted a darn thing by the time july ends and august begins the moose aren't quite as apt to get out there and do all that underwater feeding and stuff in the case of them being in the water, if that mature animal wants to rid himself of all those hundreds of thousands of biting flies, all they need to do is go into the deeper portion of the water. Over the next couple of miles, I learned the moose are good swimmers, which I already knew. I learned that they can swim up to six miles an hour, which I didn't know. Although I have had one occasion where a moose encouraged me to paddle faster away from him than he could swim. I knew that the hairs in a moose are hollow, giving them great buoyancy. I knew that they could stand in six to eight feet of water and plunge their heads to the vegetation below, although I never thought about whether they could actually submerge deeper than their legs could reach. They can't. Their huge lung capacity is the size of two five-gallon buckets, so they're always going to float in deeper water. Three weeks ago, they would be more apt to be doing that type of plunging under the water. And at a distance, you can certainly tell if it's a bull or a cow, because cows are a lot more delicate as they dip their head under the water as to where the bull has those big antlers potentially as he's 
forcefully putting his head under the water so he can get to the best vegetation where other moose don't dare to go. And that is certainly the point behind each pond has a different type of shoreline in which the area we're going to does tend to have a variety of moose, which a lot of juveniles do tend to go to it. But of course, being at that right spot at the right time is what it all comes down to. And we weren't. When we got to our pond and started paddling, Ashley noticed something in the water that none of us did. Right near the canoe launch, a lot of small pieces of vegetation were floating on the surface, and the water was murky. A moose had just been there. It had likely been feeding for hours in that spot and left just minutes before we arrived. But that's later in the story. We're still driving north. Moose used to be a lot easier. When numbers were low and they weren't hunted as much in Maine, they grew quite casual about people. Nowadays, moose are much more wary and safety conscious. That dominant bull is going to be a lot more on the tentative you well, know, just basically not wanting to step out in the opening unless he feels completely safe. Which deer are in that same family, but their instinct to stand still is the same thing behind moose. They want to stay there and look, stare, try to figure out what you're going to do next. To where the moose has such poor eyesight, they cannot see an object clearly until about 25 feet away. So that type of factor could give us a great opportunity of tricking them. When we're in canoes at a distance, if they can't hear us, smell us, they may stare at that canoe and think, hmm, I wonder if that's a moose. Where they are solitary, they're not expecting another moose to come charging right at them. So really the strategy behind us approaching them properly is with patience involved, going way out around them so where they can't smell us. Hopefully they can't hear us because we certainly should not be talking out there. And it is certainly depending on the individual. If this moose has had great experiences and never a bad experience, then they might just stick around. For the longest duration I've seen, them feeding in the water would be about two hours. And that's really a maximum that they're standing there because they just get so bloated they need to now digest at rest. They may choose to either just stand in the shaded areas or just lay down and curled up in a ball. They still can relax and regurgitate to chew their cud, which they have that four-chambered stomach allowing them to regurgitate and do that. Efficiently digesting 98% of their feed in order for them to go foraging throughout the woods looking for the certain brows being of the beach birch, poplar, or willow leaves are what they prefer on the two to eight foot tall trees. This is where driving with Ashley was so enlightening. I drive the woods, I see a moose. That's it. I've never really paid attention to what time of day, what type of conditions, what patterns of weather. It never occurred to me that the amount of moonlight the night before might influence how much nocturnal feeding they were able to do and why they might not be so hungry this morning. This moose safari took place on July 31st, the day after a rare blue moon. The full moon had been incredible all night once the storms cleared. Feeding habits fluctuate, and last night's full moon means the moose were full. The fluctuation of feeding habits does change. I've already mentioned about the full moon, but what about a new moon when it's dark out throughout the night? The mature animal understands well, why feed throughout the night when I can feed at that early cool temperature in the morning of course, during that full moon, sometimes you do get their patterns mixed up to where potentially even bad weather on the way may also tell them to hurry up and feed before that bad storm is here. You know, I'm speaking of hurricane force wind and, you know, two inches of rain or hail involved. You know, no animal wants to be out in that type of weather. I'm tagging along in a moose safari. You're tagging along with Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. The company is Northwoods Outfitters in Greenville. The guide is Ashley Patterson. She's driving us in a 12-passenger van to a spot east of First Roach Pond where we will defy the 95% odds of seeing a moose and not see one. Up next, I'm sure you've noticed a calendar cycle to when and where you see moose. Where you are most likely to see them changes every month. And that's next on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. 
We're on the road today heading up to Cacajo and then east of First Roach Pond. Our actual destination is a secret, but it doesn't matter. Because the real lesson behind today's show is to get a better idea of where to look for moose throughout the year. And that's always changing. Ashley Patterson guides for Northwoods Outfitters in Greenville. She's driving seven of us to likely moose spots. And of course, that has a lot to do with what moose foods are available. Until now, I didn't know that there was something called floating burr weed. That it was in bogs and marshes. And that moose love it. Bogs and marshes have the floating burr reed. Is what that moose is after. As far as a time frame of when we start to see these moose in the bogs and marshes, it's about July 4th on. Granted, this very road we're driving on, the month of May, 85% of our moose sightings are here on this road. But the desire for salt is going to be at certain times of the year. Now, I will admit that throughout June, you are more likely to see them on the water because, once again, trying to get away from the bugs. But during May, after that harsh winter they've gone through, that winter road salt that's laid on the roads gets washed down into low-lying areas. So if you're taking notes, they're in the roads in May, almost any time of day, licking salt left over from winter. In June, they're in the open to avoid biting insects and in the water to eat aquatic vegetation. Through much of July, they're in some of the smaller bogs and marshes as that vegetation becomes ready to eat. Okay, if I read your mind correctly, Ashley is also ready to answer your next question. You know, a lot of people ask, well, do you see more moose in the morning or afternoon? Okay, of course, that's fluctuating. In May, we do tend to see more moose in the afternoons, more so because the heating up of the day gets those bugs going. But how many times we see evidence of the wet hoof tracks that have crossed the road way more often than we see the animal, which it is estimated that there is 78,000 moose throughout Maine. So how hard could it be to find just one? Bad day to ask because it sometimes can be very hard. It is today. Sometimes the fish ain't biting, sometimes the moose ain't showing. The season changes again when autumn rolls around. Fall time activity is where they are looking for their mate and they may do some weird things. But that bull that is dominant, that has the best genetics, is going to have the best odds of breeding. In which all bulls will start to grow their antlers starting in April. If we're speaking of that five to nine year old bull with the best genetics and plentiful amount of sodium intake, he is capable of growing up to an eighth of an inch every day. But growing for the sole purpose of breeding, in which the cow is quite selective. And I have to admit, we do these trips throughout the moose hunt, well into October, yeah, and the pressure's always on. Everybody wants to find a moose. September 15th and on, we really don't find the moose on the water. Why? It's because you do have these factors of them choosing to breed. They're not focused on eating any longer. But we have about a 90% chance of seeing them on land beyond September 15th. But yeah, we have several different spots in which sometimes we are doing three guided trips at once. And everybody goes to their own preferred spot. By now, we've been driving for about 35 minutes, and we're getting close to some ponds we want to investigate. Even from a huge distance, we should be able to see any moose along the shoreline. You might not have heard this before, but moose are big. For a four- to six-year-old cow, in her prime, she can be up to a 1,000 pounds. And a six- to nine-year-old bull could be up to 1,500 pounds. Now, Northwoods Outfitters has done these type of trips for 20 years now. You know, we would certainly not have clients wanting to come out with us if we had a tax from the moose. The mother moose and her calf is going to be certainly the most dangerous animal anywhere. You know, that is common sense. We're not going to get in between her and her calf. Granted, this is not Yellowstone National Park, so we're not having the big tourist buses of people getting out and, you know, looking for that one species of animal to harass. At this point, another deer crosses the road. We've seen several deer, but not any moose in this moosey area. Ashley informs the crowd that if the deer flags its white tail, you can be sure there's another deer around somewhere. If it doesn't flag, no deer. 
Moose have tails. Do they do anything with them? Well, I, I will admit I've seen hundreds of thousands of sightings, and I think the only time it does actually move is when that cow moose is about to urinate. <laughs> if you want that kind of detail, I've got a lot more that are even worse. But it is body language that I'm always studying. You know, and there's a point behind, I have no idea what our sighting could be today. But if we have an unbelievable occasion of that moose is tricked into thinking, we must be another moose, so they become more curious. If they start walking towards us, that's not the time to panic. Keep getting pictures. Because as I already mentioned, they may not see an object clearly until about 25 feet away. They eventually will figure it out. And that's when they're going to stop in their tracks and turn around and leave. But as far as noise, you know, honestly, if the animal's walking towards us, that's not the time to start taking off your life jacket and, you know, taking off layers. You're, you're moving. You know, that's what the animal can see over a hundred yards away. We can be watching a moose. And if that moose takes its attention off from us and stares on the opposite side of a pond, something's up. You know, either another moose is about to walk out because they can either hear him or smell him or something else has caught their attention. Unusual noises may alarm them, in which if they need to run in a sprinting fashion, they can get up to 35 miles an hour. Maintaining a trot of 20 miles an hour is possible for even 10 miles. We're pulling up to our first pond. That flushes a raven off the road. Now I thought I knew everything about ravens. I thought wrong. I have to tell you, this year that the ravens have built a nest out there, and as the young have fledged the nest, boy, they are noisy and intelligent to points where they have watched the moose feeding in the water and learning that, well, the amount of blood suckers that are in moose ponds are... There's a lot of them, and some of them can be quite big. And as that moose is walking out of the water, a lot of times these big blood suckers are being pulled off by the branches. By the leeches. Yep, the big leeches drop on the ground and those ravens are intelligent enough to wait right there and pick up those leeches as the moose wanders into the woods. The average lifespan of these moose is only nine years. A cow could live up to 20 and a bull could live up to 15, but that is quite rare. And what you do also notice is the average zoo does not have a moose or a loon. You know, those are two animals that we're after today. Might in fact, the pond we're paddling has one breeding pair of loons and they have hatched a chick about 26 days ago. Pretty specific on the day, but well, if you did this for a living, you'd know the exact day that that chick was hatched, too. After 45 minutes of driving and zero minutes of moose, we have arrived at a pond that is usually really good this time of year. Well, we have all of our eggs in this basket of a <laughs> pond, so we're going to keep our fingers crossed. We might as well go down to the water and check it out and see if there's anything standing right there. Sometimes this does happen. And all you need is your camera because we're going to all come back up here and get geared up to paddle this pond if that is a decision. So just opening your doors, leave them open. All you need is your camera. But there's a problem. When we get to the shoreline, we find out we've got company. Another guide service is already at this pond. There are no moose in close proximity, and the other tour is paddling down to the other end of the lake that would normally have the most promise. We can try it, or we can move on to another pond. The decision waits until Bob Duchesne's wild mane returns in a moment. And later on today's show, what exactly are those loons saying out there? We're all going to learn how to speak loon later on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8 on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. We're on a moose safari this morning. 
The company is Northwoods Outfitters of Greenville. Ashley Patterson is the guide. There are six other people along who hail from Virginia to Georgia, hoping to see a moose. We just traveled by van to get to this spot on a remote pond, and we're just out of the vehicle. We have been instructed to be very, very quiet. Moose have bad eyes, but good ears. It's a short walk from the parking lot to the water. We're tiptoeing down quietly. There's already another van here from another moose touring company. There are canoes staged here, chained to trees. The plan is to use these and paddle to the best spot if we don't have any moose right near the landing. We're at the landing. No moose in sight anywhere. The best spot on the lake is way to the west around a small bend. We can't see it from here, but we can see canoes heading that way. Ashley points back toward the van, and we're walking back up. Once back at the van, we agreed that if there are any moose in the pond, there is a danger the other group will scare them into the woods. So we jump back in the van and head down the road another mile to a second pond. On the way, I ask Ashley about her other love, sled dogs. Well, I might as well tell you guys. Mm -hmm. um, where I live in Shirley, a town just before Greenville, has a human population of 198 people. Wow. And you do not want to be our neighbor because we own 52 sled dogs. <laughs> and yeah, they're not noisy all the time, but when it's time to eat, when it's time to run, yeah, they're lunging to go. But there is certainly a lot of chores that go along with animals, and yeah, it's, it's not like children, but, you know, to each their own. I figure that it's just like raising ten, ten children and putting them all into college would probably be about the same. You can't am crown a 250, so I do that every year. Um, and that's certainly a, a big thing in Fort Kent. I mean, they shut down Main Street. They bring in dump truck loads of snow. There's... 5,000 to 9,000 people that will all be at the ceremonial start. We've arrived at the next pond, and we've got this one all to ourselves. More canoes are chained in the racks at this launch. We grab four and lower them into the water. Everyone else is coupled up, so Ashley and I end up together in the lead canoe. Well, that's a possible mistake. We're both good paddlers, and it doesn't take long to leave the trailing canoes in the dust. Every now and then, Ashley whispers to me to stop paddling so the others can catch up. We have been instructed to be completely silent out there so as not to scare a moose that is thinking about stepping out of the woods. That's hard for me because I'm in my element here. There are cool birds around I would normally point out to everybody. Three different species of duck are leading families along the marshy edge. Ray jays call from several spots. An alder flycatcher is audible at the first bend. Blue-headed vireos sing from three different spots. At one point, crows mob a cooper's hawk trying to drive it off and I can't say anything to anybody. Altogether, we spend about an hour in the water. It's obvious to me that this is a great moose pond. There are all kinds of aquatic vegetation all around the edge of the pond. There's everything a moose could like, but no moose. Quietly, Ashley whispers to me that she had three out here in this spot yesterday. One of us is a jinx on this trip. Back on shore, back in the van. Which I am gonna pop on a little bit of AC. Yeah. Yay. And you just let me know if you start to get too cold. I wasn't going to stop and show you the evidence, but I might as well describe it to you because we just missed the moose out there. You know, knowing that as we were paddling out, as we went to the right side of that big bay of rocks, there was all kinds of evidence of that pipe wort that has been pulled up. The I water was it. all stirred around, so you did, didn't you? I saw it. Very mm -hmm. obvious. That was literally mm, an hour before we showed up. And that little bugger didn't want to stick around. But you can certainly tell that as the feeding pattern begins, they start from one side of the pond and feed to the other side of the shoreline. Which I would only assume it's probably the cow or the calf that we saw in that exact spot yesterday morning. That's the luck of the draw and how frustrating it really can be because, well, it's the salt on the wound knowing that the animal was there and missed up, darn it. Right. But I'm not going to give up hope because this kind of stuff does happen in which we have a couple of other bogs to check out. 
just got to keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> we have about a 95% success rate during the month of June and July. By the end of this month, it drops down to about a 70% success. And why I say this very specific is because by the end of this month, there is no bugs, the heat, yeah. everything comes into play. I mean, it's, it's very frustrating knowing that some tours we can pull off seeing six or seven moose on the water and then the next day it drops dramatically. That was a nice paddle. I like that pond. Oh, I love that pond. But it is a little nicer when you have the <laughs> pressure removed. Yeah, either. I know. <laughs> That's all right. It makes it so enjoyable when you get up in the first 10 minutes. Then you can relax the rest of the morning. Not really. It makes the job look too easy when you show up there and the animals stand right there in the middle of the water. But I just assume that rocky channel we went through, that tends to be where the moose are. Yeah, <laughs> that looks so good. Which, why we can a lot of times figure that they're going to be either in there, because you can tell that there's a lot of shorelines that aren't really getting the heavy wind. Mm -hmm. I was expecting one to step out any minute in that area. That was really good looking. Which it's weird because they, I want to say I haven't been really seeing them in there like I did last year. Uh, but that's another one of those fluctuation factors. Last year was a weird year. and the Water levels were high for a long time and the vegetation came in kind of late. At least up around uh, Baxter. We're now working on plan B. There are, of course, a lot of good places for moose in the area. We're just passing through Kakajo, and we'll go check out Lazy Tom Stream. It's one of those breathtaking spots in Maine where this idyllic stream lines up with Big Spencer Mountain in the background and gives you one of those photo opportunities that's worthy of a postcard. I've seen moose in here before, but maybe one time in ten, so I don't have my hopes up. And now that we've left the pond we were just on... Well, knowing that we're well away from our pond, I might as well tell you that some of those leeches in there can get rather big. But in fact, quite a few years ago, we watched a cow moose walk out of the water, and she had a big dangly leech off her belly. And as she shook the water off, the leech kind of fell off, slapped on top of a rock, and that's a big leech. Well, we went over and measured it with my Leatherman, to be official or not, foot long. Oh my god. Big around as a quarter. You just touched it and blood oozed out of it. Yeah, it just look gross. So far, no luck. I'm on a moose safari with Northwoods Outfitters. Ashley Patterson is the guide. You already know that we're going to finish this tour without a moose sighting. Now, I'm not sure who the jinx is on this trip, but I know who it isn't. I'll tell you when we wrap up the moose safari in a couple of minutes, and then we'll move on and learn how to speak loon. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket with Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. We're at the tail end of a mooseless moose safari. Hey, it happens. Ashley Patterson is guiding for Northwoods Outfitters in Greenville, and she's doing her darndest to find a moose up here on the east side of Moosehead Lake. We've been over to some ponds east of First Roach Pond. We've just hit Lazy Tom Stream north of Cacajo. We're heading south again, planning to stop at a couple of spots around Prong Pond. The other six passengers in the van are from the southern U.S., and their chances of seeing a moose today are dwindling rapidly. There's a jinx in this van, and it's not me. You see, this moose safari left the Northwoods Outfitters parking lot at 6 a.m. I had to leave the house at 4 a.m. to get here on time. On this particular night, it was a full moon, and I've already seen a moose before the safari has even begun. As happens way too often, a moose was standing along the side of the road in Shirley as I was passing through a young bull. It looks like the full moon has been our problem all along today. When there is plenty of light at night, the moose can feed heavily all night, and they're full and inclined to doze by daybreak. We've seen plenty of moose this morning, but they're likely all bedded down to digest the night's feast. That's certainly why the moon phase will affect the moose more so than the deer. You know, and that's another factor of frustration. 
Because sometimes, even when everything's going just right, you still don't see them sometimes. But when we lack the animal activity in the morning, you have an increase of it in the afternoon, typically. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly what I would only assume is that, yeah, if we're not really having the best of luck this morning, and yeah, and all the spots that we typically see moose on that Lily Bay Road, there was a deer there this morning. Not a good sign. You know, honestly, when you see deer in that spot, the moose will not travel out behind them. Why is literally a instinct to stay away from the deer, but there is a disease that the deer can pass on to the moose. I might as well go through this whole period of, if they're breeding in the middle of September to early October, her gestation will last 231 days. So they're giving birth in the middle of May to early June to a calf that is going to be 25 pounds and will nurse for six to eight weeks, but gains two to four pounds every day. They should be with their mother for a full year. That's how they learn where to go and what to eat right. in order to survive. But in the case to where if she is at the right age, you know, between the age of five to nine, she's been impregnated with four calves to carry throughout that winter. You know, if everything goes just right, which no, it never does in mother nature. So in the case to where her body will start to reabsorb the unborn fetus if she needs to to make sure that her life is spared or at least ah. one of her calves lives is spared so that's always a point to where yeah those cows could be carrying twins triplets so on and so forth yeah, and that's where two-year-old cows will go into their first heat cycle but they don't quite know why they're getting chased around so they may not even be bred but that's another point to where as a two-year-old they have to certainly take into account mother nature make sure that she doesn't start to catabolize the muscle tissue you know that would be that last resort after reabsorbing the fetus and that's really the point of today's show i see moose a lot i'm always up in the woods but spending time with an expert is teaching me a bunch of things i didn't know over the next mile actually explains how to age a moose if you can see a grayish tone to the lower leg, it's three years or older. If the body looks black, a cow moose will have a more brownish face, probably a four to five year old cow. If it's a distinctive two-tone coat coloration, it's a juvenile moose. A one-year-old, an obvious two-tone, if it's a two-year-old, it'll be a little browner toward the butt. A five to seven-year-old bull will have a black face. Now I hope you're taking notes because I'm not going to remember all this. Now, if the moose would just keep going back to the exact same places every day, this would be a lot easier. But what I do notice as far as the pattern is every five to nine days, they tend to go to a completely different spot. I've already mentioned their home range is around 10 square miles. There's a lot of particular spots that they're visiting. But I have one other spot. I don't think they're hauling gravel out of that spot. There's one particular road that I mean, if you guys are okay with it, I'm going to go check another road. You never know. But I am always willing to give a little extra effort because, you know, sometimes animals aren't all that cooperative, apparently. But you just got to be just stubborn enough. Today, the moose are more stubborn than we are. Plan A didn't work. We just missed them at the ponds. Plan B didn't work. All the places right off the Lily Bay Road, right up through Kakajo. Well, I don't know what plan C would be, but <laughs> we're running out, huh? Yeah. I, apparently so. Can you just take us back? That's fine. Yeah, yeah I'll empty out. Yeah, I'll empty out. Exactly. Blueberry pancakes. You know the safari is over when the clients are talking about breakfast at Dottie M's in Greenville. But we wrap up with one final surprise. Maybe nobody is a jinx this morning. Maybe it's the media. Maybe Moose are media shy, as Ashley reveals that when John Holyoke of the Bangor Daily News tagged along, they also didn't get a moose. Because the last time that they had the Bangor Daily News come out with me, what do you think happened? Oh, is happened? that right? Did you do, they Nothing. went with you, Holyoke? <laughs> Same thing <laughs> that, happened. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody wants now we know to the come curse. out. That's yeah. funny. Now we know the curse. <laughs> I gave Holyoke a lot of trouble for not finding a moose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, how did you miss them?
My thanks for a terrific morning with Northwoods Outfitters and Ashley Patterson. I learned a lot about critters I've always just kind of taken for granted. We'll definitely have to try this again sometime. Up next, loons, another critter we kind of take for granted. They make a lot of different noises out there in the lake. In a moment, I'll teach you what they're saying. You're about to learn how to speak loon as Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine continues on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Loons. Every Mainer is familiar with them. Tourists will spend big bucks to stay in a place where they can fall asleep to the eerie sounds. Loons make a lot of noise out there. But did you ever wonder what they're saying to each other? All those sounds aren't just random chance. It's time you learned how to speak loon. When you break it all down, there are four distinct vocalizations they make. They may mean slightly different things under slightly different circumstances, but this will give you something to listen for and to watch for under the circumstances in which they do these things. Number one, the pear tremolo. It's the crazy laugh. And if you've ever heard crazy as a loon, this is where it comes from. Sometimes at night they're doing this call just to announce their presence, a territorial call that warns other intruding loons to stay away from their side of the lake. When it's dark, loons don't know when they're straying into each other's territories, so you hear them a lot at night making sure they don't get into an unnecessary conflict. Loons will fight each other, sometimes to the death. During the day, the tremolo is often a warning sign of danger. For instance, if an eagle flies over the lake, or a seaplane takes off, or boats get too close, look to see if the tremolo is their alarm reaction to the disturbance. If a second loon answers, it is likely the mate, announcing that it understands the danger and may be coming to help out against any threat to the nest or chick. Sometimes you'll hear this when a loon is flying overhead. That's just an announcement call to let other loons know its presence, again, to avoid conflict. Loons don't make a lot of noise when they're out on the ocean, but they will give the warning tremolo sometimes. I was nine miles offshore in a puffin watch a few weeks ago, and a loon got nervous about the boat and gave off the tremolo. Number two, the whale. This is the haunting call that loons use to tell each other their locations. Pairs try to stay together, both to protect the young and sometimes to cooperate on feeding. So they tell each other where they are. If you see a pair close together, they're probably not wailing all that much because they don't have a story to tell. But once they drift apart some distance, expect the whale. And you might expect the two birds to move slowly closer together. Number three, the yodel. Only the male does this one. This is strictly territorial. Each male loon has his own distinctive yodel, and he'll even change it up if he changes location, perhaps when he moves to another pond. Loons will fight, so staking out territorial claims helps avoid bloodshed. If you see loons rising up and flapping wings while making the yodel, 
or even starting to dance across the surface a little bit, the territorial argument is starting to get serious. And remember, if you're in a boat and you're getting close, that warning yodel may be for you. Loons start to get uncomfortable when you get within about a football field length of their nests. If it's a tremolo as you're getting close, that may be the female expressing alarm too. Take the warning and move off. Number four, the hoot. These are the soft, short noises that loons make to each other to keep the family close together. Parents may hoot to the chick or they may hoot to each other. Actually, it's not terribly different than what chickens do. Whenever they're foraging around the yard, all those little clucking sounds are just organizational, keeping the clan together for safety and cooperation. That's it for Loon Calls. We end the show with a last-minute invitation. Horundo Wildlife Refuge in Old Town holds its family fun day this weekend. It's a Sunday event, 10.30 to 5. Gudrun Ketsuta is the chief naturalist at the refuge. And in just four minutes, here's everything the kids and you might like to do. Welcome to the show, Gudrun. Pleasure to be here. Certainly. A family fun day at Horundo Wildlife Refuge. A Sunday event from 10.30 to 5. And... I notice you've got like five different things that need a little bit of explaining. So since this is a last-minute invitation for everybody to go, what are you going to do with hands-on silk screening? Well, actually, what's happening there is um, we have Chris Sader coming from Orono, and she will have made two silk screens, one of insects and one with an owl life, and you can bring your own T-shirt or you can buy one of our T-shirts. And uh, you can practice how to do silk screen and put one of those beautiful uh, images onto a T-shirt. Okay. Spiders. You're going to do something with spiders? Yes. We have Donnie Sinderson come. She's a main mass naturalist. And she will give us, she will give an introduction to spiders to introduce the people who are maybe a little weary of spiders. And also go hunt for them, find, look for their nets and where they would be located and give people an introduction. How many people do you think, in terms of percentage of population, actually want to do that? I don't know. I hope many. <laughs> uh, well, actually, spiders are quite interesting. They're fascinating. Um, I like to view them from the distance, uh, but they're definitely um, fascinating um, insects. Well, they really are. They are fascinating, and I agree with you. At a distance, they're wonderful. Mm, yes. But we'll hope that uh, well, we're getting a little of a close-up, but not too close. <laughs> <laughs> a bio blitz. Those are becoming much more popular. I see a lot of organizations doing that. So how are you going to do your bio blitz, and what is it? Well, um, what a bio blitz is, usually you go out for a 24-hour period, and you look for um, a species, animal species or plant species, and you collect them, and then you identify them. We don't have 24 hours. No. And our bio blitz is only uh, about an hour. But we uh, invite people to come, also fishermen, um, and we will send people out and we collect fish and um, or anything else that floats around in the water. And then we'll have a group of people looking at the collection. And then we have an idea who lives in the Hulunda waters. And we have, a, prior to the collection, we have electrofishing where well, Steve Cochran from the University of Maine and Greg Innes will help him, will be um, stunning fish in the water and pulling them out and identify them and put them back in, of course. Stunning fish. So they're going to use electricity to stun the fish and yes. just see what's in Push Austrian. What do you think they're going to find? Well, one year he was uh, Steve Cochran found actually a cusk, a freshwater cusk, which is unusual in the sense that they usually like colder water. So we did find that. But we also found um, chain pickerel. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, unfortunately, pike. Yeah, in I was going to say. <laughs> yes, lots of it. Uh, and uh, sunfish, pumpkin seed fish. And so there's a variety of different fish. Oh, actually, what we have also is our canoe race. We have a canoe obstacle race and uh, in lock door in a little pot. And uh, so we measure the time and winner gets. So it's an obstacle canoe race where the kids yes. and the parents go at it. Yes. All right, so it's family fun day. It's uh, I guess the hour is at 10.30 to 5. Yes, there are. We're starting at 10.30 with a welcome and then heading right, starting right away with electrofishing, which is a really exciting um, demonstration. 
and then the fish will come out on land and everybody can take a look at them. And we end um, our day with a guided canoe paddle in 28-foot canoes. Well, if anybody wanted a last-minute invitation, they just got one. Yes. <laughs> Family Fun Day at Horondo in Old Town. A Sunday event this weekend from 1030 to 5. Bring your lunch next weekend. We'll visit what just might be Maine's most secret state park. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Supercuts in Bangor, Brewer, and Old Town. Join me again every Saturday at 9, Sunday at 8, and online afterwards at 92.9theticket.com. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.